I served as a police officer for 10 years. I did my first five at Derbyshire Constabulary in the East Midlands, and the latter half of my service was in the Metropolitan Police in London, where I ended up working at Scotland Yard. While I was there, something which leapt out was this extraordinary level of under-recording of serious offences. Robberies, serious sexual offences, rape. I did my job, which I'm sure you can imagine went down like a lead balloon. And I ended up having no choice but to act as a whistleblower. So I ended up sparking a whole parliamentary inquiry into the way that police forces up and down England record crime. And that permanently changed the way that crime is recorded and things are significantly more accurate now. And the inspectorate does crime data integrity analyses of forces on a regular basis. The Cold Case Foundation is a charitable organization based in Utah and founded by ex-behavioural science unit officers from the FBI, profilers. Greg Cooper was a second generation profiler trained by legends like Roy Hazelwood and John Douglas. And he headed up the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, VICAP, for a period of time before becoming a police chief. The chairman emeritus of the foundation is John Douglas himself. The work the foundation does is hugely important. They're out training law enforcement. They are investigating cold cases and bringing peace to victims, some of whom remain nameless, and justice to families who've waited years and years. The foundation is the good work. That's exactly what it is. I was watching the Netflix series on Henry Lee Lucas, the confessions killer, the guy who admitted to tons of offenses that he didn't do. And I saw, I think it was episode six, and I saw Greg talking about the foundation and how they'd actually started to look at these cases and look for the real suspects. And it struck a chord with me because of everything from Scotland Yard. So I reached out and I sent an email and had an initial chat with with Greg and Dean Jackson and joined the team as an investigator. I now sit on the executive support team as the director of intelligence, bringing that skill set from, from my policing experience and my professional life now to bear on these cold cases because that's the place where I can add the most value. Cold Case Live as a concept came to me fairly early on in that relationship and I was thinking about the different ways that we might be able to get people more involved in cold case investigation work but in a controlled way. Educating people around this internet free for all which we seem to be stuck in. Teaching people investigative standards and genuinely valuable skills that can then be put to work through a controlled process and an ethical process to, to make this crowdsourced activity viable and remove some of the behavior which makes it a hindrance to police forces as well. That's teamwork and teamwork starts with team building. And team building is all about sharing expertise and experience. So that's what Cold Case Live is. It's part of coldcase.live or Cold Case Live. And it's a way for us to examine in depth these cases, some of these cases which mean something to us. The case in the first season, Robert Ben Rhodes, means a lot to the foundation, to its inception, to its creation, because that case followed Greg Cooper from his time in the BSU all the way back to his time as a police chief. And it's really demonstrative of how 
cold cases and cross-jurisdictional issues impact the ability of law enforcement to get the offenders into prison. So it has almost every learning point you could wish for. The intent of the podcast is over 12 episodes in a season to do a real deep dive into one of these cases to explore using the experts on the Cold Case Foundation team, the themes and the facets and the aspects of it and those learning points and create solutions. It's not about this fetishization, I suppose, of true crime cases. It's not about pulling up on doorsteps while investigations are live. That's not something that I agree with even personally. It's about getting to the heart of the issues and finding out what we can do differently and put them under a real lens, the way that we would in an investigation. Robert Ben Rhodes was a serial killer. He was a truck driver with a traumatic family background who was into BDSM. And in 1990, he went on a killing spree between January and April. During that time, he killed a couple who he picked up near Pasadena. He kidnapped, kept, tortured, and took back to Houston, to his apartment, another woman who escaped. He murdered a 14-year-old girl and her boyfriend who'd run away from home only days before the woman escaped from his apartment. And he was caught by a highway patrol officer in Arizona with a woman who he'd captured that day and had already chained up and placed in a horse bit in the back of his truck. The man was an animal and he's where he needs to be, which is Menard Correctional Facility in Illinois, a place that he will never be released from. The Rhodes case is complicated. His spree, the 1990 spree on its own, that single route over that couple of months was over 5,000 miles long. And the area of that offending was over 640,000 square miles, six times the size of the UK. He crossed over jurisdictions, state lines, county lines. And what it illustrated was that there was some rudimentary communication through facts, through missing persons reports, through bulletins, but there's nothing instantaneous, nothing that would immediately give you this connection to this pattern. So one of the, the big takeaways from that investigation is the need for real-time, joined up, cross-jurisdiction data, which is accessible to every single one of the 27,000 agencies and offices across the states to make sure that people like Rhodes are captured early on. The other aspect to it is the need for vetting in certain professions and actually looking at how we can use the examination of cases involving truck drivers to create a vetting system, a risk identification system, so that they can be tracked through their careers and at the points where things may happen, which could prompt them to become serial offenders or they start to exhibit patterns of behavior or circumstance which have been triggering to others in the past, then that needs to be flagged up, identified and dealt with. So these are the big, big learning things and then there are the more generalized things, which is that DNA technology has come a long way, so bodies are identified quicker, or there are longer term opportunities to 
use DNA to identify family members in order to identify a suspect or an unidentified person or anybody else involved in the case. A lot has changed, but at the same time, not a lot has changed. And there's still so much work that could be done just to make immediate improvements. At the end of it all, I've come up with some technological solutions. So a driver vetting system. There's the crime recording system called Themis, which has been worked on, which is going to be released. We've worked out a way to give officers who think they might have a historic roads case on their hands, a criteria briefing and a secure and safe referral mechanism so they can discuss it with us. And then there's what I call Doe Theory, which came about by accident, really. Doe actually stands for Damage, Opportunity and Evasion. And it's the way of looking at those criteria which you can condense to a vetting risk assessment, which will tell you that the higher the risk is, the more risk there is of a serious offence being committed by that individual if they score high in certain areas like relationship breakdown, childhood trauma, unsupervised time, the ability to cross jurisdictions. A series of, of questions effectively which need to be answered. And what that tells you is that the higher the risk, the greater the probability that a victim is going to be hard to identify or harder to discover. Delaying a police investigation and allowing that offender to carry on for a longer period of time. And that is part of something which I call fixing broken roads, which is a broader theory about reducing the opportunity of offenders like that and actually increasing the societal protection for people who would be as victims. So it's quite an in-depth piece of work. And it's gone from a podcast to being a book. I've discovered countless other cases which I'm now carrying around with me with a sense of responsibility for. There's one, for example, I call her the girl in the pasture. And initially she could have been a Rhodes victim, but isn't. It was a, a badly recorded entry in a database, but 12 to 14 years old found as skeletal remains in, in a pasture in Texas. Been there since 1983. And even though the case was recorded way back then, her name still isn't known. I carry away from it this sense of responsibility, which is something that all of us at the foundation do to make things better. Nobody deserves to be murdered and nobody deserves to go so many years without their name being known. What's next for Cold Case Live is we're launching the app. So we're moving into that realm where we're gonna be able to put this expertise in people's pockets 24 seven and build this community of people who want to be involved. We're gonna continue building partnerships as we have with people like Hunter Killer. We're gonna keep pushing the envelope really of everything that's possible and everything that we can share until we start to hit this tipping point of making a real difference and making it count. If you want to get stuck in and support what we're doing, you can visit coldcase.live forward slash join, $3.99 a month, that gives you access to the community, the social platform that we're building, articles, extra podcasts. We're on the second season of a web series called By The Numbers, The Academy, everything that we're building. And you get perks as well, like a discount with Hunter Killer. 
And something I'm really excited about, having done this first season of Out of the Cold, I've written the book about roads, and I'm really pleased to say that 45% of the net profit from that is going to be going to the foundation. So we're going to be launching pre-orders for that soon, even though it comes out on the 1st of February 2022. But that's another way that people can pitch in. And it's another thing where we're not asking for something for nothing. It's well within that design, really, of giving something back and increasing the level of education and being able to use the funds which are generated to train law enforcement, to catch the bad guys, to support the victims, to support the families, to help them get closure. And that's why we do it. <laughs>